¡Vacíen los tanques! ¡Vacíen los tanques! Being back working with David and Jillian is just like riding a bike. All three of us just fell right back into it. I cannot believe I'm here. I can't believe they're here. There's no such thing as an X-Files episode that's not challenging. I can imagine what that must be like as a fan. You see these familiar faces and the familiar cross beams of light coming out of the darkness and hear that soundtrack. really putting the band back together. The people you're going to see doing these episodes are the people who actually helped to create the X-Files series. He knew that the first and the sixth were mythology episodes, and then the ones in the middle would be standalones. That was really whatever Jim and Darren and I came up with. I knew that there was a big interest from the fans to see more monster stuff, but also we have a big fandom based around the mythology. You want to satisfy the mythology of it, and then there's going to be standalones, and of those standalones, there's going to be one that's funnier than the others. Looks like he gave it a pretty good shot. And I think I hit it right in its horn. It had a horn, like a unicorn? Horns, like a lizard or something. I like the idea that we're not doing just one story, or we're not just doing standalone separate episodes, we're doing a combination, because that's what the show always was. Even in a standalone episode, there's some story to advance that's not just about the case. We always tried to have kind of a human element. It was always tied to how it affected Mulder and Scully as human beings, and the same here. You look exhausted, Mulder. It was a long day at the office. They're going through all these weird stories, but the through line is them confronting their age and confronting their life choices. You ran the X-Files. You were the X-Files. You all but wrote the book. I'm afraid that book is closed. I yes, also are the X-Files. The X-Files are a unit at the FBI. X stands for the unknown. These are the cases that the FBI either has put away or has left unsolved. Agent Mulder picked up this investigation. His quest came as a result of his belief that his sister had been abducted by aliens. I was 12 when it happened. My sister was eight. She just disappeared out of her bed one night. He kind of derails his own stellar young career at the Bureau to start chasing after aliens. He starts getting close, and the Bureau itself is alerted to this guy who's uh, rattling too many cages, and they assign a younger agent, who's a medical doctor, Dana Scully, to debunk Mulder's research. And that's how we begin. Do you believe in the existence of extraterrestrials? Logically, I would have to say no. But she is ultimately enlisted in Mulder's quest. She becomes as involved in the X-Files as he. I came to believe in the existence of extraterrestrial life and in a conspiracy inside the government to keep their existence a secret. Through the course of the show, when it ran for over 200 episodes, the characters grew. I failed in every respect. But you only fail if you give up. And I know you. You can't give up. Mulder and Scully for nine years had a platonic relationship. Even though we suggest that they have a child together, we never saw them as a couple until the second movie where we saw them definitely together. When we come back to them in the new series, we will have been honest to their relationship previously, but we now find them in another state. Seven or eight years have elapsed. Time has been difficult for their relationship. We will investigate what's happened in that time. It's good for you to get out of that little house every once in a while certainly was good for you. I think that where we find Mulder and Scully perfectly delivers us into a similar dynamic that we've had before, which is huge intimacy and appreciation and yet frustration, but still love and care and potential. I'm always happy to see you. 
and I'm always happy to find a reason. In the past week, we've had some pretty quintessentially Mulder Scully scenes. With the distance of time, there's a new appreciation for those and what they mean and bring and the excitement. I can imagine the audience will have. Yeah. I'm here. You know, character doesn't change. Mulder and Scully, they're not going to change profoundly, but they're going to age, and that is its own kind of profound change. I'm a middle-aged man, Scully. Maybe it's time to put away childish things. And that was always important, to not play the same exact characters doing the same things, because 22 years have passed. I don't do stairs anymore. Mulder, back in the day, I used to do stairs and in three-inch heels. Back in the day is now. I think it was about tapping into her innocence. I think it wasn't until I kind of got back into that zone that I started to remember her a bit more on a physiological level. It's like an unconscious intuitive thing to get back into that character that you played for so long. There's a bit of rustiness in the beginning, first couple days, but after that, I feel pretty Mulder-like showing up on set. Just listen to me. No, you listen to me, Scully, Mulder. you gotta trust me on this. <laughs> It's fun. It's fun to be in the middle of it. One of the reasons I was coming back is we're dealing with a world that has changed completely from the time when the series ended in 2002, which was not long after the World Trade Center bombing. The American public had put their faith completely in the government. They didn't want to know about government conspiracies. They wanted to know that their government was protecting them. It feels like a lot of the things that Mulder was warning us of kind of came true. All of us are tracked on our phones. There's drones up ahead. So much has changed in the world, and the X-Files now gets a chance to tell stories from that perspective. 9-11 was a false flag operation. It was a warm-up to World War III. Joe McHale plays Tad O'Malley, who's a conservative talk show host. Just knowing that I was going to be able to be on this series that I am a massive fan of, I couldn't believe my good fortune. And then you meet David Duchovny and Gillian Anderson. They are so cool, and I asked them uh, way too many questions. To I think they detected that I was a fan, especially when I asked them to sign my skin with a tattoo. Two needle. I cast Joel McHale after seeing his appearance at the White House Correspondents' uh, Dinner, which was hilarious, and he had exactly the quality I was looking for. He is very conservative, but his ideas about conspiracy theories match up exactly with Mulder's. It's all part of a conspiracy dating back to the UFO crash at Roswell in 1947. My character wants to get a hold of Mulder, and that's how it starts. Join me for a little ride? Right here is fine. Low-flying aircraft often employ what they call dirt boxes to record conversations that I prefer private. Aircraft employed by whom? He's really an amalgamation of so many characters on the internet who believe that there is not just an alien conspiracy, but a possible conspiracy of men. What I need is your expertise. Our expertise for what? I'm rattling some pretty big cages in the intelligence community. I start a ball rolling that turns into a boulder. Where are they? The files. I don't know where they are. You said no one had been down here. It hadn't been touched. Not for 13 years since you and Scully left the Bureau. Originally, I think that Skinner was brought in to be somewhat of a roadblock to what Mulder and Scully were doing. And I think after a certain point, he realized that what these two agents were trying to do was to bring the truth out. So Skinner eventually became their champion. He still is a company man, but perhaps not looked on with favor because he's been an assistant director for almost 25 years now. Perhaps a lot of that has to do with his relationship with Mulder and Scully. I need access to the X-Files. Can you tell me what this is about? We both kind of just fell right back into Mulder and Skinner right away and just seemed natural that it was fun. You owe me some answers, you Just calm the hell down, Mulder, before we both get pissed off. For episode one, I came up with a young woman who was an alien abductee. We cast a lovely actress named Annette Mahendru. You probably don't recognize me. No, I think I'd remember. The story is going somewhere really, really uh, fascinating and something that's very timely right now. Chris is tapping into something very important. Annette asked me questions about her character which were unexpected. And actually, I rewrote the script based on some of her questions. She was thinking about the character in a way that sometimes writers don't. We really get to see who she is. Chris gave me a lot of story to play with, where she came from, why she's here. These are from over 20 years. How many times have you been abducted, Svara? I lost count, and then there are the screen memories they implant. The memories implanted over actual memories to make abductees forget. I'm familiar with the syndrome. 
Gali has also been abducted, and so she's very reluctant to go back there again. She's a very good actress, and I enjoyed the depth that she brought to that character. It was nice to play off of her. You were a couple before. I'm sorry, what? You and Mr. Mulder. And you have a child together? Mulder and Scully have a child. We were always very vague about how that happened since there was no apparent time or place that child could have been conceived, but it becomes a larger question as we move forward. As parents, we made a difficult sacrifice to keep him safe. It was for his own good to put him up for adoption, but I can't help but think of him, Fox. There's guilt, definitely for giving up a child, even if it was for its own safety. The most interesting thing to me is imagining what your life would be if you had raised the child. He'd be 15 years old now. I miss every single year of his life. Sometimes I hate myself that I didn't have the courage to stand by him. It brought up some incredibly interesting, profound subject matters about family, abandonment, life, unanswered questions. It's always fun as an actor to do material that is challenging. I believe that you will find the answers to the biggest mysteries, and I will be there when you do. But my mysteries, I'll never have the answer. I'm not going to reveal to you exactly how we play with mythology, but we do. I like the twist that Chris put on the mythology. We've already announced that the cigarette smoking man will be back on the show, and I think we're honest to what happened to him in the series finale and how he might have survived what looked like certain death. We have a small problem. Mulder is my enemy, but he's also someone I want. And of course, I won't tell you what happens. We are playing with this mythology in a whole new way, and the government's secreting of evidence about extraterrestrials might come into play. In 1973, the syndicate was convened to assist in a project to colonize the world by creating alien-human hybrids. The project was ultimately unsuccessful. I doubt they ever stopped trying. Coming back together, being on the set again, was a powerful thing. But there's so much hard work to be done because we knew that coming back, the series isn't going to be good if it's only a victory lap. It has to be original and fresh and as good as it's ever been. So you've got to get down to business. The first day was unbelievable, and I was trying to play it cool. Spider, this is Dana Scully and Fox Mulder. Hi. The little kid inside of me was just like, ah! David and Jillian just sat back into Scully and Mulder and was incredible. And then the second day we were downtown Vancouver in a scene during lunchtime. So there was a thousand people watching us. They were very excited that David Duchovny and Jillian Anderson were on the street. Joel McHale was like, is this what it's like when you guys film outside all the time? I was like, no, this is a special occasion. We tried to find parts of Vancouver that can play for parts of Washington, D.C. to create everything else digitally. I wrote this sequence, this crash, which uh, may or may not be Roswell in the first episode. And as is often the case when you're dealing with Mark Freeborn and his art department, they came up with a UFO crash that was so much bigger and better than I ever imagined it would be. Chris had specific notions about what the craft should be. It was a pretty good jumping off point. I think everybody wanted to see the 1950s classic flying saucer, the one that created all the fear and all the wonder. We probably made the bigger one than has been made for TV. The saucer was 50 feet in diameter, life size. <laughs> It took a team of painters and sculptors and visual effects. It was really just all hands on deck. Pre-built everything in the city, break it down into its component parts, ship it all up there and then reassemble it. I remember coming over the rise and we were in this huge, vast land and it was this giant flying saucer. I was like, oh my God, this is a huge $100 million movie. I got a shiver because I knew I'm part of something really special. The crash site is photographed practically. The actual crash itself was achieved through visual effects. And that's a combination of CG animation for the, the UFO, and then we have particle simulation. We need to have it blend seamlessly with the practical UFO set. Visual effects took care of the actual flying, but we supplied all of the practical, tangible assets. Three wrecked aircraft, a trench that was about 300 yards long, and practical explosives to create the crash landing of the craft. There will be an air cannon here. We will be shooting up debris. 
Chris could get his actors right beside the craft, feel the craft as a real entity. You arrive on the set and you see what you could only imagine. I was blown away. X-Files is generally a lot of like character-driven action. This has been very action-heavy for X-Files. And as the scripts come in, you don't have a lot of time to react. And we had all sorts of stunt people and stunt driving. There was a lot of killing and the ripping apart of people. Scully takes down a guy. Jillian did it all herself. She looked great and slick. I had five or six stunt people fully engulfed on fire. That takes a lot of timing and fueling and it's dangerous. You have to be methodical about how you do that. We had multiple elements. We had shots with visual effects. Mulder had to be thrown down a hallway. <laughs> Most of that was done with a stunt harness rig. Visual effects was just doing a sort of wire removal. With all the action that we do, Chris always wants it to be. I believe that could happen. Even though there's monsters and aliens, it has to make sense and it has to look realistic. I find it fun to try to learn things that I don't know. We see a side of Mulder we haven't seen before. He busts out some fight skills. In the X-Files, we want to be real. How would Mulder fight? And both Chris and David had the same answer. Whatever he learned in Quantico. So after the punch, he comes in with his left. You scoop it here and come on the inside for a hook. The other character in the fight is the room. How the room is in the set design very much dictates how the fight goes. What can we wreck? What can we smash through? What gets destroyed? So we started there and choreographed a fight when we're to smash that window. That desk goes, breakaway chair over here. We broke it up into three to five moves for David. Right, right, all right. So that he could learn that piece and David could do most of it himself. It was two lines in a script and it ended up taking us nine hours to shoot it. Who sent you? If we're lucky, we'll get a hint of what's coming down the pipe and they can start building or designing towards that, get a little bit of a head start, especially for makeup effects. It's a fresh kill. I always wanted a more kind of classic universal horror creature of the Black Lagoon type of thing, but I also need expressions and to do some kind of funny stuff with the monster, so he's got to be more mobile. Rather than go through a 10-hour process of covering someone hand, head to toe, we took the approach of making it all as large prosthetic appliances, pre-painting everything in my shop. When we went to set, it was just a matter of assembling the puzzle. The special effects makeup guy, you know, when you go monster, that's what they live for. They turn into a monster. They become their own creation. <laughs> Did that just happen? A decade of my life in this office in search of the truth. And all the time I was being led by my nose through a dark alley to a dead end, exactly as they planned. The poster has become so iconic, it's really the heart of the show because it doesn't say, I believe. It says, I want to believe. It's the struggle to find the truth. You always wondered if they weren't lying to you too. The title of the first episode is My Struggle. I was reading a terrific series of books by a guy named Knausgaard, the first one called My Struggle, about his life. And so I thought, why not get into the intimate detail of Mulder's life? Scully, listen to me. I've been misled. We've been misled. But episode six will also be called My Struggle, but it'll be Scully's struggle. And you'll see the details of her struggle through her own eyes. You have something to tell me. Something you need to know. There's a part of me always that comes to the show as a fan, and in just a few scenes, I really have a lot of rich material to play. When I see the pilot, I'm just reminded about all the hard work that went into it, all the mistakes, all the potential, the nights and the forest with David and Jillian, the pouring rain, the freezing cold, that pilot was a miracle. So for me, I'm reminded when you believe in something and you have passion for something, it pays off. I have seen this before, believing that you're onto some truth that you can save the world. This will finally be their undoing. It'll be your undoing, Mulder. I like the intimate scenes between Mulder and Scully that bring us closer together, adding to the history of the series. Listen to me, as your friend and as a physician, you are on dangerous ground here. I know what I'm doing. You could possibly make 12 different shows out of this show. It's a very flexible frame in terms of tonality, in terms of action, in terms of mythology, in terms of subject matter. It can go a lot of different ways. And the fans, I think, like all those ways that it goes. It doesn't look anything like this. The thing I saw only had two eyes, and it was wearing underwear. Boxers or briefs? On the one hand, it feels like no time has passed and that we've just kind of picked up where we've left off. And on the other hand, when we ran the other day. <laughs> oh, sorry. 
bit of privacy, please. If you're going to do X-Files, do it to the nth degree. I think I did that. I've been nude, I've been transformed, I've been sexed. <laughs> I've done it all. The fans are obviously very excited it's returning. The phenomenon is still there. The truth is still out there. Maybe, maybe it's a foot. It was definitely an animal. Animals don't shoot blood out of their eyeballs. Well, tell that to the horned lizard, which shoots blood out its eyeball, Scully. Motor the internet is not good for you. It's so wonderful to be a small part of this universe that I love so much. It's really fun to walk into this cultural phenomenon and be a part of it, and to see these actors playing these iconic roles again. This is dangerous. When has that ever stopped us before? I'm part of television history right now. There are very few, if any, shows that have the same recognition as The X-Files. I'm just so glad that when I die, people will say he was in The X-Files. I want to prepare you for what you're about to see, Mr. Mulder. There aren't really any shows quite like it on TV anymore. All we can do, Scully, is pull the thread and see what it unravels. The story that it sets up is really interesting. We've never been in more danger. And do something about it. Reopening the X-Files is magical. Are you ready for this? I don't know there's a choice.